Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the Economic Development Commission meeting February 11th, 2022. I'm afraid I'm your substitute teacher for the day. <laughs> uh, Ms. Phil can't be here uh, or maybe uh, a bit late. So first and foremost, I'd like to um, welcome our new EDC uh, council representatives, uh, Assistant Mayor Joe Kelly and um, Councillor uh, Vince Lombardi. Very glad to have you both here. Uh, look forward to, I know I speak for everyone when I say we look forward to working with you and uh, would love to get uh, your thoughts perhaps uh, on the EDC and how we can do our best work together uh, with the council and with uh, the other commissions and boards. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome um, Sean Clancy, who is our next, see if I can get this right, uh, Assistant City Manager for Economic Development. Oh. Uh, nice. being, being trained up and readied by our current Assistant City Manager for Economic Development, Nancy Cromer. So glad to have you here and look forward to working with you as well, very much. All right, item one is approval of the last meeting minutes of January 7th. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Second, Caitlin. All in favor? All right. Aye. Any opposition? Okay, motion passes smoothly as ever. All right, next on our agenda is uh, Assistant City Attorney Jane Farini, uh, who's going to share some information mm -hmm. on uh, recent legislative committee activities. All yours. Morning, Jane. Good morning, Jane. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Well, it is uh, once again a very different sort of legislative session due to COVID and um, uh, very political, I think. I, am, I think that's an understatement. Um, session, which is unlike prior sessions. So that affects what's going to pass through, you know, not what gets requested, but what's actually going to be successful. One of the things is that uh, the, what just happened yesterday was there's a bill on short-term rentals. Some of you have been familiar with that issue in Portsmouth. That bill would allow short-term rentals in every single family home and duplex in any district all throughout the state. And the city um, oppose that bill for two reasons primarily um, theoretically it sounds like a means by which to create more housing and let people stay in their homes and have you know money to sustain the increased valuations and increased taxes but if you've paid attention uh, countrywide and internationally it has the effect of at least in Portsmouth really decimating um, apartments because folks that own an apartment who can make more money doing the short-term rental than they can for a long-term resident obviously they'll, they'll very likely make that choice um, the other concern is valuation of property so this bill that was amended yesterday and passed the Senate unanimously in the committee will go probably, I don't know if it will go on the consent calendar for, for the next time the Senate meets, but um, it definitely has all indications of passing out of the Senate and into the House. So um, one of the things that is also concerning is that the, it does, it's not an owner-occupied short-term rental bill. It is uh, anyone can own the property. And we're finding, particularly in the Lakes region and the Mountains region, that um, entities like the Marriott are buying up single-family residents and you know advertising those at short-term rentals so that's the concern obviously to Portsmouth you folks you know on one on one end the the homeowners uh, will probably economically benefit you know if they engage in short-term rentals but from this committee's perspective I think the whole issue of workforce housing and just housing in general, cost of housing, workforce housing, and apartments will be 
seriously affected. Um, so I think that's the that's the one that isn't labeled workforce housing, but yet, it, in fact, it it seems to to it. Well, I think it will have a very a very large effect. Um, and I think that we had a um, on January 31st we had the first meeting of the legislative subcommittee. And assistant mayor is on that committee, which is terrific, along with the mayor and um, Councillor Cook and Councillor Tabor. And they identified legislative issues that are going to be their priorities throughout this session. The first one is um, municipal authority. And as you can see by what I just described with short-term rentals, that, real, that bill, if it passes, is, amends every zoning ordinance in every city and in every town. So that's what we call a statewide zoning amendment. Um, and that's something, theoretically, that most municipalities, um, you know, obviously do not favor because we want to be able to, um, we know what's best for our communities and no communities are alike. So not only does the city typically and the legislative subcommittee typically oppose those kinds of bills, but the New Hampshire Municipal Association also traditionally, no matter what the subject of the bill, if it's taking away local control, it's opposed. So there's quite a few of those. Um, I won't go through all of those, but there are a lot of statewide zoning amendments. Um, Again, most of those in theory seem to be a good idea, right? Short-term rentals, you know, seem to be a good idea. Tiny houses allowed, you know, everywhere seem to be a good idea. But you really have to read each bill and see how it impacts individual towns. So, um, so that's something that is interesting. One of the other bills similar to this is every single family house could have four units by right. So, you know, there's lots of good intentions, I think, trying to get more housing in the state, but the practical application, how it applies to certain districts, you know, zoning districts, could be, could be problematic, uh, particularly in Portsmouth. The other um, issue that was, that was identified as a pri priority is uh, climate change. And certainly there are bills on wind energy, and energy in general that the committee um, definitely wants to focus on. The other issue, which is, you're all really familiar with this one, is all the downshifting bills from the state over the last 10 years onto cities and towns. There is a bill, um, you know, for instance, that comes back every year trying to get the state to pay at least a small portion of retirement costs. And, you know, those kinds of things that, um, that that help cities obviously have healthy and robust budgets. The other uh, bill that I can um, think of relative to that is, for an example, the meals and rooms tax. So last year there was an amendment to that bill, um, and that was primarily, you should be aware, from the efforts of the mayor's roundtable. Um, that. Uh, is a group of all the mayors of all the cities in New Hampshire, and they got together through COVID to address the issues of COVID, but then continued their conversations about legislative issues of interest. And one of the ones uh, last year was the Meals and Rooms. And as all of you are very well familiar, the city has been, <laughs> Nancy, I think, began the conversation with the legislature about trying to look at that formula to make it more fair to those communities that um, really host all of the tourists, which is the economic engine um, for the Meals and Rooms. So that was a good bill last year because it increased the amount that's distributed back to each municipality. There's another one pending on, you know, a similar reconfiguration of that particular uh, distribution, which would be an improvement. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we watch. Um, sometimes retirement bills can sneak in there and, they, you know, which are, again, good for retirees, but, again, impact municipalities' bottom line. So there's that fiscal uh, component. Um, yes? Uh, 
through the you have some new members on the commission. Um, for those that may not know the distribution formula for meals oh, okay. and rooms tax, it's based on your population. Yes. Not on what you contribute to the state. So a city like Derry has a higher population than Portsmouth, but not anywhere near the tourism impact, would receive a higher amount, a bigger return than, than Portsmouth does. And last year, they did increase that slightly. And I maybe you know, Jane, I don't know what percent. But um, their goal was to return 40%, I think, over over time. But they've, they've maybe been around 20? Yeah, it was 22 years ago. I don't know what the percentage of the distribution was last year, but it was a, definitely an increase, both by amount that was generated and the new formula increased the percentage to return back to cities and towns. But it certainly wasn't the 40% that was originally contemplated in the statute. But I don't have the figure right. off the top of my head. And our original efforts were not that successful <laughs> um, because other legislators look at Portsmouth and think, you know, we have a golden egg here, but we, you know, we have a lot of expenses that go with yeah, that. Right. And the other piece is that, um, so we turned our attention to maybe the idea of what was called a pillow tax, which was, um, you know, a, a, an overnight tax for, um, for, for guests, minor, um, and to give local control for that. And we didn't get too far with that either. <laughs> right, and we still aren't because the, there was the bill introduced this session and I believe uh, it was tabled, but there's a pending motion to ITL it, which is to kill it. Um, I've heard through the grapevine that it might come back as maybe a study committee as an amendment to another bill uh, this session. So that'll be something that, again, will be looked at uh, hopefully through a study committee or again brought back uh, for another year and and as Nancy said the pillow tax uh, or hotel occupancy fee when when that began Nancy I think uh, many of the legislators had no idea what we you know what what our needs were and what the impacts of tourism are to particular cities and towns and so now I think there are all sorts of smaller towns and that, that are realizing you know, that have supported that hotel occupancy concept, whereas I think when the conversation began, Portsmouth was, you know, um, we're always the first at the table, I think, because we see things, uh, I think, more quickly just due to the nature of our, of our community. But um, I don't think that will, will have great success. Um, and just one other thing to that, I think the, the Chamber did a lot of work with our hospitality properties <coughs> to, to yes. engage them because one, in fact, the, I think the lodging association uh, objected to to that proposal, but um, Valerie and Ben and company were able to speak with with our hospitality properties and 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 work around. It wouldn't be so bad if some of that money went to marketing the community. So, so that's where we ended, I believe. Yes, exactly, and and you know that still was an option under the the uh, the bill that was proposed. So if it does go to study committee, I think it's a real opportunity for the chamber to and and the city to reach out to the hospitality industry and try to try to figure out a path forward that that's acceptable. I think we were quite close. Uh, a couple, what was it, two years ago, Nancy, we had far more support than we had ever had before. So it's not impossible. And you know, you just keep going back. And, and once again, as, as Nancy, you know, indicated, we weren't successful the, the first time, but but we had a lot more support. And that was in large part due to the, the chamber, you know, communicating with the tourism and what's acceptable to you. You know, what what can you live with if 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 this money does go at least a portion of it to to certain types of things that benefit at tourism, how how can we make this a win win? So I anticipate that that whether or not it goes to study committee, that's something again that the chamber can continue to work with our, with our, you know, our tourist economy and see what what might be acceptable moving forward. Um, the other area we have to pay attention to is right to know, and many of you know through Zoom meetings how convenient that was, and how the right to know law says you need physical quorum present and all of that. So there's lots of bills trying to. Um, 
not go back well some of them are, are trying to to say we can have completely virtual meetings but other of them are trying to to meet a middle ground so that you know um, some of our public bodies in in Portsmouth and all throughout the state are smaller you know smaller groups of folks and and so uh, I think there's a push in the legislature to try to amend the right to know law about public meetings uh, and you know quorums and physical presence so there's a bunch of those that we'd obviously be interested in and watch um, child care was another priority identified um, not only through our our city council retreat which you'll hear more about later today but also from the committee as a priority um, and there are several bills unfortunately two of them were uh, just voted inexpedient to legislate um, relative to creating funds for child care and and that sort of thing so my my impression this session is that again they may not be successful but again um, you know th this committee certainly understands the importance of folks working and and having child care and uh, so that's an interesting issue for for this committee to to identify as well and then you know there are some workforce housing bills there are bills that are trying to clarify what the role of the housing appeals board is you know is and trying to expedite processes in the superior court for appeals on land use um, and the you know the I think the SB 400 um, that's a, a broad brush bill on housing it includes to train local boards um, has provisions relative to workforce housing um, and I think that's been supported by the governor um, and that bill um, had a hearing but it's still in 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 the senate um in senate committee so there are bills that are out there that will, are trying to make workforce housing easier and there's a lot of bills like i said in the zoning piece that talk about easing dimensional requirements and height restrictions and removing parking requirements and all of that so um even if a bill isn't labeled you know workforce housing i think there's a lot and I think the mayor said it uh, very well at the last meeting. He said, well, Concord is responding to a vacuum. You know, lots of cities and towns want to do something, but they don't know, you know, what to do to address the, the housing. So I think that's why a lot of these bills um, are coming forward, because there's, there's obviously an identified need. Um, but, but And some of them, again, may have some unintended consequences. All the intentions are are i think to try to make it easier um to get to get housing and i know there are um several seminars one last tuesday one next week on housing in portsmouth which i'm sure uh you guys are aware of and i think you have your the josiah bartlett study on your agenda today so it's certainly a, a you know a, a priority of the of the of the legislative <clears throat> subcommittee it's because it's a priority of the of the council so we watch these and we you know we 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 digest them it's there's going to be a lot of back and forth before we see what actually comes out um my understanding is that it's um it's a it's a challenging session and um you know i'm seeing lots of inexpedient to legislate come through in the last week or so on bills they're just killing a lot of bills redistricting is taking a lot of energy uh, as you well know, uh, vaccines and masks seem to be uh, sucking the air out of the room. Um, so there, so some of these other bills that would have, I think, had some some good attention. I don't know that the legislature really can can address you know um, everything that it that it sets out to do in the beginning of the session. And then ed funding obviously is something that we track a lot of you know um, and remember the swept uh, when when it's a statewide education property tax uh, portion of the of what we collected in the city was uh, sent to the state to redistribute um, there is a coalition communities 2.0 which is a group of uh, cities and towns who would be new donor towns under recommendations on the Commission on Education Funding uh, report, which which came out um, last year, 
again, the legislature uh, doesn't appear to have any appetite to dismantle that education funding piece. It's a very complex piece. There were some very detailed and comprehensive bills introduced. Um, and uh, the one that was sort of kind of listed was really kind of a mirror of the commission's report was just turned into, I believe, interim study. Um, let's see. Can I jump in, Mr. Chairman, while Jane's looking to see if she's got anything else? I have information here on the meals and rooms tax. Um, I don't have the percentage increase, and I know it was certainly not what we were looking for, which was 40 percent. Right. But the amount that the city um, received via distribution uh, was $1.12 million in FY21, and in this current uh, fiscal year, it's one63 So we did get a half a million dollars more. And I think there was a... Uh, sentiment in the legislature that you're not going to get 40 but you're going to get whatever this new percentage is and that should be that should stay at that at that level right we're going to stay at this higher level but not the one we ultimately wanted right okay. and I think what they did is they slightly lowered what um, what a, a business owner needs to pay in the meals and rooms by I think 0.5 percent mm -hmm. and then they increased the distribution uh, to cities and towns but we're, we're not at the 40 percent uh, we're, we're not there but they did at least acknowledge after I think what a decade <laughs> that that I think it really was a decade <laughs> that they had to start to give some of that distribution back to cities and towns. Um, I think some of that was prompted by, by COVID, obviously. Uh, and but I do think that it it really is. It, it was a good. It was a it was a good first step. You know. So I think I think and I think that's kind of the broad brush summary that that I have. Um, did you want to talk about where you're going to put that list and if people want to access sure. it? Sure. So this is this is a list, but for some technical glitches, w would have been posted on our legislative uh, subcommittee page. What I'm going to do is I'm going to link the bills as well. So there will be, um, you can just go to bills that we're tracking. There'll be a, um, on our legislative subcommittee page. And when you're looking for that, that's under government. So you go into the city you go you click on government and then you click on the legislative subcommittee and we post all the testimony and the bills that we've testified on um, and also we uh, I'll be posting our updated legislative principles and um, policies on how we testify and, and who gets to and why and um, the links to these bills uh, and I think I have I think this is like 70 bills right now that I've <laughs> kind of tracked but a lot of those are kind of falling off the wayside so but it'll be a live document so you should be able to go on it and click on the most recent version of the bill and then um, my last action I, I'm trying to update every week so we'll know if it's in committee if it's been been voted out um, and I will have a uh, a definitional section to, to so you can understand my abbreviations. Great. Uh, Tom? Uh, Jane, uh, what's the bill, uh, Senate bill number for that uh, short term stay? Oh, the short term rental 49. is 249. And it was amended yesterday. It was it was an executive session yesterday. The um, committee voted 5 0 to pass it. Many of the folks in the, I think it, I think it was Commerce, supported and sponsored the bill. It has bipartisan support in the Senate, and um, so it is. I didn't read that it's on the consent calendar for the Senate for the full Senate's vote, but I, if if I do my if my math is correct, I would be surprised that it would be defeated in the Senate given the sponsors on the bill. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the House. So we'll cross over into the House, uh, and again, we'll have our opportunity. There will be public hearing. They'll exec it. It'll go to the floor. So um, it, it might be, you know, um, a good idea to reach out to some of your colleagues in other, other, uh, other cities and towns that that uh, that may may be affected by this. Um, I know the New Hampshire Municipal Association. Uh, and a lot of uh, cities and towns affected by this uh, helped with an op-ed um, that, that kind of talked about what I'm talking about now, how this has unintended consequences and how it could be actually negative. And I'll have to, I have not 
seen that that's been published yet, but I will, um, I'll let Nancy know and she can send you out a link uh, relative and that, that'll give you a really good nuts and bolts analysis as to, you know, why this, why this might be, uh, have some negative impact. Jacob? Just a um, quick question. The bill itself, what kind of provisions does it give for municipal governments to make any changes to it? Or do we have, does it give us any power to make any kind of changes at a local level? I'm reading it as, as, yes and no, I'm a lawyer, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> how do I answer everything? Um, n no, in so far as you must allow them and you can't district them out. That's how I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's really making a change to our, to our ordinances. Um, it does give you the right to require sort of a, an agent and to inspect and to um, have sort of a, a fee associated with these kinds of uh, kinds of uh, properties. I I am saying it's not the best written bill in the world, so I suspect there'll be challenges to it. Uh, if it's vague and you can't enforce it, um, you know, I suspect that, that there may be challenges. The analogy that I can give you is the accessory dwelling. Mm -hmm. So what happened is they, like this amendment, there's a paragraph and said, all you guys got to do <laughs> accessory dwellings now. And then our smart planners come and they write a clear zoning ordinance that describes with specifics what you can and cannot do but some of those specifics were mandated by the bill so it has you know so many feet and you can't restrict this and you must allow this and that sort of thing so i'm 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 reading this giving municipalities very limited control over short-term rentals other than the inspection piece and the registration piece but you couldn't zone it out you couldn't say you're unable to have a short-term rental in this single-family residence and this duplex. Okay. And then as a follow to that, um, has there ever been kind of a study inside the city or that has been done recently on short-term housing or short-term rentals within the city? I don't know if we've ever done kind of a global look at that as a city to see how it would affect us. That's a very good question. That is a great question. I'm not familiar uh, of any study I do know that there was a work session many years ago about uh, drafting a particular short-term rental ordinance, and I know that information was was you know gathered at that time. But you know, I think that was in early stages of of the of the short-term rental issue. And I, if I recall correctly, we were looking at other jurisdictions, not only what they drafted, but how it was impacting. But I'm not familiar with a with a study. On, on Portsmouth, I'm sure there are, are examples of, uh, I know for sure, in the U.S. and internationally, what happens when there's no res no restrictions on short-term rentals. And you can probably think yourself about five communities where you've heard there are no more residents. You know, it's it's a it's a vacation place from Thursday to to Monday, and the residents kind of leave. And and I think that's the that's the concern we have for for Portsmouth. No, I, and I agree because I mean North Conway is a great one. I can think exactly of, Bartlett. A, uh, I'm a downtown renter, so <laughs> yeah. You know, I I think that's a good thing to bring up for sure. Through the chair, if there's a report back I can provide on, on what we may know, I'll be happy to do that. Great. Um, yeah. um, what is so given that New Hampshire isn't a home rule state, how do you see the the legislative subcommittee's um, principle around municipal authority? playing out, is it that you have to address the bills one-on-one, -on -one, or is there something that could be looked at more broadly given our the, the, that we're not a home rule state? That's a great question. Um, there are various ways we can register uh, uh, in opposition or in favor of a bill. One of them is submitting risk, written testimony. One of them is to go and testify. The other is to just indicate on the bill itself, we oppose it, and we are part of the public record as opposing it. I think um, for some of these, um, you know, some of these authority bills, we will go the, the latter. You know, we'll just get on, you know, get on record that that we oppose 
this bill, um, depending on the subject matter, I think uh, that that kind of then moves it up to the point of do we send written testimony and do we, um, you know, go and have uh, one of our legislative subcommittee members or the mayor t uh, testify. Um, I think that um, also we work very closely, the city does, almost on a weekly basis, sometimes this, during the this legislative season, several times a week with the New Hampshire Municipal Association. So we're very actively engaged with what they're doing. We have great communication with them. Um, I think Karen gets emails from Margaret, the executive director, every other day. Uh, you know, so we're very in tune with what might, we get alerts as well. And so um, they're familiar with, with our activity here. And we're probably one of the more active communities in the legislature and have been for many years. And there's actually a little award in the hallway when you walk through that, that the city council got several years ago. Um, so yeah, there's a various ways that, 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 that we can register our opposition to, to, to bills, particularly on the municipal authority. Tom, you had a question? Just, just a follow-up question. Um, so it sounds like it's primarily a use yes. law, and, but it may be so widely worded as it affects everything else, including conditions and things of that nature. You talk about the health inspections, but I think about the parking problems which would develop when you have a, a, a single family home with four bedrooms that suddenly has five cars over the weekend. Um, exactly. Particularly in a, in a city like Portsmouth that has a lot of on-street parking. So is there a, a way of developing a, a sort of a backup strategy to oppose this? You know, if the primary thing is make it all or nothing because it then becomes, at least for some communities, something that they have to oppose versus just figure out a way of watering this down so that if it does pass, it doesn't create a total nightmare. That's a great question, and and you must they must have heard you when they made their amendment to the bill yesterday because <laughs> because the sentence that they added just yesterday was quote nothing in this paragraph shall limit a municipality's existing authority to gen generally regulate parking noise safety health or sanitation under duly adopted ordinances and regulations authorized under state statute so it appears that you may still have parking regulations but it's it's rather vague generally regulate parking i mean we have we have some parking regulations associated with particular types of buildings and types of uses already in our ordinance. So we'd have to look at that. And um, it, but and as a companion to this, there is a statewide zoning ordinance bill that says for that four unit for a single family that you can't restrict parking. You have to count it like a regular residence, even though you can have four units. So there's maybe one or two bills that uh, that are addressing the parking issue kind of anticipating exactly you know exactly that concept of you know what can we restrict and what we can't the other troubling piece of this it's a three strikes you're out so if someone has in fact violated you know noise and rubbish or whatever uh, the other amendment that was uh, added uh, yesterday was um, a municipality that has ordinances and registration can't revoke the registration for the short-term rental unless the property has two or more proven violations of ordinances impacting the health or safety of the community. So that's going to be a huge enforcement uh, effort on the part of every city in town to try to you know to to formalize those proven violations well proven you know again general terms vague let's challenge it however proven violation seems to me to be uh, not just a, a letter from us you know it may, me meaning that you you would need to take more steps as far as uh, as far as uh, enforcing and confirming those violations so um, it is not it is not, um, and, and again, you're exactly right, Tom. You'll take this and then you'll you'll try to craft, you know, uh, an amendment to the zoning ordinance if we if we have to. That tries to protect 
you know, our health and safety as best we can. But um, I think that two, three strikes and you're out is, is, a, is you know, um, again, um, challenging for enforcement. So call your call the senators. Call your can <laughs> call everybody you know. Uh, they're just not seeing. I think it, because I don't think they're impacted like Portsmouth. If you're not a resort community, and tour, uh, you know Portsmouth is very unique. You know we 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 have tourism, um, but but you know it's not just the summer. Uh, we have a big hospitality community that we that we encourage and. Um, but we also have that the residential component and our need for apartments and housing. So, um, not some small town in you know uh, some place in New Hampshire that has a couple of folks who want to stay in their home and rent a short-term rental. That's a very different uh, impact than than other types of cities in town. And there doesn't seem to be a carve out or a distinction. You know, it, it almost, uh, we were talking about this yesterday, it almost should be that certain communities that have tourism should be able to have some minimal regulations because it, it, really, it really could be a very challenging end result. I would just like to add that, Senator, I wish Caitlin were here to hear this, but uh, Senator Perkins Cuoco has been extremely responsive. Um, we have a great working relationship with her and her staff, so, um, and I'm sure it'll be the same with the House members. Yes. Does anyone else have questions for the city attorney on the bills or the STR? I did have one question, or if uh, you could maybe clarify where short-term rentals are currently allowed, just uh, or whether they're currently allowed under our existing zoning. Um, so we were involved in a Supreme Court case uh, called uh, Working Stiffs in 2018, and they are not permitted in they are not permitted as dwelling units in residential uh, districts in the city. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they, are, they were determined to be transient occupancies, which is impermissible, like a hotel, a motel, uh, a bed and breakfast, that sort of thing. So what we find in the city because of that case, a lot of folks uh, apply for bed and breakfast. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll make an application for, for a bed and breakfast. We enforce based upon complaints. So it isn't like we have done a survey and found, you know, perhaps where they might be in districts where they shouldn't be. Um, I do know that, you know, before this bill was introduced, that that was on the short list of, of things to address in our zoning ordinance to further clarify. Um, so basically, we have a permissive zoning ordinance. So if something isn't specifically allowed, it's disallowed. And that was what that case was about, and the language of our ordinance indicated that we, that we could restrict them because they were indicated to be a transient use, which was impermissible as a dwelling unit in residential districts. You might have heard a recent case in uh, Conway. They had a similar uh, ordinance, but not identical to ours, and their ordinance was found insufficient to restrict short-term rentals. So it was really um, a statutory interpretation case, which was really drilled down. It was 40-some-odd pages with, uh, with a very colorful judge who um, loved words, many Latin phrases I even had to look up myself, but uh, <laughs> even referenced, uh, you know, what hotels, how people stay in hotels and how that can be sometimes indicate, you know, residential use and cited Eloise and Fonzie from Happy Days as examples <laughs> of long-term, it was really quite an entertaining decision um, that, that was uh, appealed to the Supreme Court, but Suffice it to say that 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 our ordinance, uh, because of how it was written, was permitted to restrict in residential districts as dwelling units transient use of short-term rental. Thank you. Thank you. Just, yeah. Any other questions? Well, I I would just maybe ask the city attorney if there's other ways that you see the uh, EDC as being able to be involved in any of these cases or where there might be some input from the city level or testimony. <coughs> just to keep us informed or let us know? I think that would be very, very helpful. 
um, I I will definitely maybe use Nancy as a conduit to alert you folks um, when it goes to the house and the public hearing in the house. Um, I think that's at this point that seems to be um, where it's headed um, in the short term. Um, you know, obviously. Uh, th th I, I think the Senate's going to, regardless of the impact given the sponsors, I think, I don't know that the sponsors are going to change their mind or, you know, at this point, but really it, when it comes to the House and, you know, any, any conversations that you may have with our business community, any negative impacts that they may have, particularly about housing and apartments and how difficult is it now and what do they, what do they do now? Where, where are their workers staying? What happens in the summer with the students that come internationally where are they housed you know e examples of, of potential impacts or even current impacts I think would be extremely helpful um, from our community and from other communities okay. thank you yeah so that's going to good I, I might ask that Ben since you're here if you've heard from the kind of the lodging community on um, their kind of thoughts and engagement on SB 249 uh, Opal at this point or if they're I have not had any specific conversations with them. Um, you know, I would certainly think the, the lodging properties would not be thrilled about the uh, prospects of uh, additional competition um, in, in the community. Uh, so I, I think that would be a pretty safe um, assumption. Um, as far as beyond that, um, uh, I think as a whole, the industry would welcome um, a variety of options. I, I, don't, I don't think... Um, I think, just as the Assistant City Attorney uh, mentioned, um, it would have to be done in the right way. Um, I look at the impact it would have on, um, you know, potentially a, a business owner that provides housing for their employees. If they could turn that housing into a short-term rental and start, you know, making money from it, would that discourage them from providing housing for their employees for their J-1 visas? I think that would have, um, again, unintended consequences that would be negative uh, for our workforce and, and workforce housing. So. Um, those would be my initial concerns. Yeah, thank you. I do know in the past the, the testimony from the B&B um, owners have, have been, they have been quite vocal in opposition to this sure. because they obviously have regulations that they need to comply with and then they have this, the short-term rental and residence, which, which obviously is a very different, uh, very different uh, oversight on regulation. To, maybe this will come up later as well, but do we have a question on the business retention and expansion survey around whether businesses provide housing, short-term housing for interns or employees and where they might be located? If we don't, we might have I don't think so. We do, but that's a very good yeah, idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Well, that was very helpful. Thank you. I thought uh, while we have the city attorney here, if, um, maybe we could put you on the spot a little bit. I know we have ARPA funding status a little bit later on in the agenda, just to maybe ask if you'd be prepared to give us an update on timing or um, anything that EDC should be aware of. Sure. So we got our first tranche uh, back in May. Um, that was a little bit over $6 million. And um, we're getting our second tranche. Uh, it will be approximately early May, maybe the first two weeks in May we're anticipating. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what has happened is the staff uh, department heads have kind of created uh, wish lists and projects and identified within and without the community various uses for those funds. Those are being streamlined. There's, there's a spreadsheet on all of that, but what we're now doing is converting those to um, a format that would, that would be uniform for each request and that all of those are going to be converted into that form and then those particular identified um, projects will be um, sent to the poly policy makers in, in some form for further discussion. But we are are in process we um, will be getting that second tranche and um, we are very excited about about kind of brainstorming and reaching out to the public and and having conversations as well about uh, through our obviously through our decision makers how to use these funds moving forward if I can add to that mr. chairman sure. uh, we haven't spent any of the money yet we've obligated or suggested that we would like to use uh, one point uh, five point one nine million 
that equates to what we calculated was our lost revenue projection um, toward the acquisition of community campus that, that we haven't dispersed those funds yet. Um, so none's been spent. Um, the previous council discussed assembling a committee of both, I think, council members and members of the public to help decide where the money could be spent. That, that didn't take place in the last session, so I think that's on the table for the current council. Um, so if, we, if the total is 12.88 and we've committed 5.19 to the community campus acquisition, that, that's where the balance lies at the moment. Just a quick question. What is the current plan for the use of community campus? We need a whole separate meeting for that. No. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Everything. <laughs> you know, the, the, the short answer is the reason the foundation for Seacoast Health was as comfortable as they were in identifying us as the most appropriate buyer was that we would honor their commitment to housing, supporting, and, and working collaboratively with nonprofits and like entities. So that's, that's sort of, uh, that's, that's plan, plan A. Um, the Recreation Department would love to use it for things. The Health Department would love to use it for uh, public health and safety related things. And um, the uh, School Department is actively looking at relocating the Lister Academy from the Sherburne School to that facility. So uh, those are the short answers. But, um, okay. and we hope to take ownership, uh, ownership of it at the end of this month. Okay. Because if that's 50% of the funding being allocated, then that's a pretty hefty sum just for priorities you know, just with yeah that also includes not only the building itself but um, two buildable parcels as we understand it one that's nine acres and one that's almost two acres okay. Great, thank you thanks thank you city attorney I know we had some good discussion and conversation over the original presentation we had last year so it's great to hear that things are progressing and um, we'll look forward to hearing more as, as things come out on the recommended uses so thank you thank you Thanks, Jane. Uh, so uh, next on the agenda, we've got our subcommittee reports. Um, maybe do some quick updates there, if there's any updates since last month before hearing from uh, City Council Moreau. Uh, Alan or Bob, do you guys have any updates on the business retention? Uh, yes. Uh, Alan and I and uh, Andy, are you, are you on the... Uh I indicated a subcommittee sign, yeah okay uh so we'll send you an invitation as well <laughs> to, the, uh, <laughs> to the uh zoom call we have with the unh survey center uh with sean mckinley and zach azim i don't know zach um to just talk about streamlining the um the survey and digitizing it so thank you to alan for following up with uh, with Sean, but we'll so we'll have more direction uh, after next Wednesday, I think, and uh, can get the ball rolling. So I would think very soon. Great, thank you. And then uh, any any more updates or anything to share with EDC from um, since last month, Tom or Sarah on the sustainable cities and EV charger? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, primarily on the electric vehicle charging so uh, the well I won't repeat the whole thing even though we have some new people in the room but uh, what has happened since our last meeting is we were able to get together uh, once just before Nancy went off on her private Olympic experience <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, Peter Rice and Ben Fletcher join us uh, at that meeting. And uh, Peter had actually done some uh, additional research on his own after the uh, initial meeting we had with him. And he came back and said that he had identified the Bridge Street parking lot as the most likely uh, or most suitable, I guess I would say, center for a fast charging uh, 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 installation um, partially that one of the in addition to being centrally located uh, it also uh, is subject or is, is planned to be the subject of a complete redesign and repaving in the next year 
and uh, as part of that the uh, the lot is going to be uh, real realigned the parking space is realigned the number of spaces are going to be reduced uh, and so it it would work well uh, if fast charging uh, stations could be uh, introduced into that plan uh, before that work is done so there wouldn't be any you know stranded cost by redoing the lot and then having to go back and retrofit it afterwards um, so he identified that and then he also uh, and, and I should say so he identified four spaces down in the I think it's the northeast uh, northwest corner of the lot the the intersection of uh, Hanover Street and uh, Bridge Street across from Provident, right? yes across from Provident um, not not facing uh, toward the old 30 Maplewood building but facing toward the Provident Bank and uh, um, and she so also did some research on the cost factors which proved to be somewhat alarming <laughs> at least from the subcommittee's perspective uh, so uh, something of this nature requires expenditures for both the equipment the actual uh, pylons uh, and and related equipment and also the infrastructure which is essentially getting the electricity to the site uh, so the cost of a, a pylon with two charging heads this is a fast uh, uh, level three fast charging looks like it's about forty thousand dollars per pylon so that means that in order to have four units there uh, two two pylons and four charging heads you're looking at eighty thousand dollars and then the cost of uh, getting electricity to the site again uh, and actually I have something I wanted to pass out because I know we've talked about level one level two and three and I came across something doing some research which I thought was was real uh, helpful in uh, illustrating um, what you know what what these different levels will serve um, and what what makes this is kind of interesting is that it uh, I have more if we need it is that uh, it doesn't a lot of the stuff you read about describes the length of time it takes to charge a car at uh, different levels this talks about how many miles you'll get off of one hour's worth of charging uh, at each of these levels so it's it's uh, I, I think it frames the issue a little better and it, and it also explains why a level three is the preferred is now the preferred standard in the industry so unless you're charging at home or you have a, a, a job where you're sitting at a site for eight hours a day the level one and level two really don't work for you um, so so the 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 problem we partially have in the city we might have mentioned it once before is that our downtown electrical grid is uh, is not is, is inadequate frankly it uh, every time that there's a major product uh, project uh, major development in the downtown area uh, significant electrical infrastructure has to be added into it uh, example recently was Mark McNabb's building on the corner of Penhallow and Daniel Street they actually had to run subsurface uh, power lines down uh, uh, Penhallow Street in order to have adequate service to that building um, the, the principal cost associated with this type of um, infrastructure for a fast charging station is you, you need a transformer that will uh, get 480 volts to that had so to speak where the pylon would be so if if we were looking at a a, a, a two pylon four charging uh, uh, arms on that site you're potentially looking at hundred and eighty thousand dollars expenditure just I ran into Peter on Wednesday and he told me that figure is probably low so it, it, it it's likely to be upwards or over two hundred thousand I will say that having spent a fair amount of time surfing the internet on this issue I see numbers all over the place and there are some of these companies that advertise that they'll do one of these things for forty to fifty thousand dollars including the transformer so it's not clear to me how much of this is is associated with the unit how much is associated with 
sportsmen's this particular issue of not having an adequate electrical grid. Um, so uh, the committee hashed over that, uh, those numbers, and, and I think we kind of left things feeling a little, uh, uh, this might be more to bite off than we can afford. Um, and, and the other committee member here is Sarah, so Sarah doesn't even know this yet. <laughs> but uh, um, after that meeting, uh, I reached out to uh, Tim White at the New Hampshire Department of uh, Environmental Services. Tim is the uh, technician in charge of the Volkswagen Trust uh, electrical electrification program. And basically my question to him is that it, it seems like these numbers are fairly extraordinary. Uh, I know that there, are, you know, Tesla has been putting these electric charging stations, fast charging stations all over the place, and it's hard for me to believe that they're paying $200,000 per installation. So he, it, 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 it caused me to rethink our approach on this, and it, it occurred to me that um, there, there, there must be other models for doing this. I've, I've read that there are gas stations down in the D.C. area that have been converting from uh, actual you know petroleum products to electrification uh, again it seemed like a lot of money to for that type of conversion for someone who just has a gas station so when i reached out to tim he explained that the state as part of its rfp program has maintained a list in which communities who don't have a specific plan can be listed as uh, being willing to consider proposals for fast charging stations within the communities. And by placing yourself on that list, you're inviting the companies that, that uh, sell and operate these charging stations uh, to make proposals. So uh, mm -hmm. most recently, uh, uh, last week, Karen and Peter and I had a conference call uh, to discuss that, and I'll let Karen uh, follow up on where that's <coughs> at. Uh, but it, it was my... Uh, suggesting that we ought to at least get on that list as sort of a no harm, no foul. Right. Uh, worst case is we get proposals we don't like. Uh, and at least my thinking is that we ought to even contemplate the next step would be to do some type of a, uh, a non-binding RFP uh, ourselves, uh, particularly as this, uh, this uh, pilot program or, or this grant program starts to fade. This month is the end of the the application deadline for it, that uh, you know, we ought to really flesh out what it would cost to, to have this type of thing installed in Portsmouth. Uh, and then the latest development is that uh, just Monday night, the city council adopted a proposal by Josh Denton to ask the city manager and, and the department heads to work up the cost and, and the uh, and the potential sources of funds, including uh, being placed in the CIP for uh, level three stations in uh, fiscal year 2023. So um, I'll let Karen answer that again in a minute uh, as, as part of where we're at. But just uh, yesterday morning, I believe, the Federal Department of Transportation and the Federal Department of Energy announced the uh, new programs to allocate the monies that were in the federal infrastructure bill and it appears that there will be 615 million dollars available to the states in fiscal year 2022 which seems to me that's only like four and a half months so i'm not sure how they're going to do this but um and that money is going to be it's already been allocated among the states but the states have to come forward with proposals on how they're going to spend that by august 1st and this may not be part of the legislative program, but it seems to me that uh, the city ought to get some input with DES on how we can get these funds for what I'll call inner city or downtown locations instead of just focusing on the uh, arteries, if you will, which is what the current round of, of uh, grant programs are for. So. Uh, It'll, plus, there'll be another $2.5 billion uh, to be announced later this year. Uh, not, not sure of any of the details of that yet. And as you know, uh, Biden has uh, suggested that he wants to see about uh, 500,000 change uh, fast ch uh, charges 
by uh, 2030. So uh, my, uh, my recommendation at this point, uh, sorry for doing this without you, Sarah, but I couldn't get the meeting together real quick, is that uh, I, I'd like to see this commission endorse uh, a program of bringing fast chargers into the downtown area um, and in the short uh, term to uh, in, in, uh, encourage the increased deployment of those through the uh, process that Karen is undergoing with the, with the funding opportunities. Um, and to try to prepare a, a almost a shovel ready project so when this next round of money comes we can get on it right away instead of losing out on our inability to do the current Volkswagen. Having done a deep dive on that Volkswagen re requirements, it's not likely that we would have get the funding for what we want to do. It's really meant to be out close to the highways, that type of thing. So. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, I, I do have one other uh, suggestion that's sort of secondary to that, but I saw an interesting piece um, about a week or two ago. Oh, no, actually, it goes back to the end of January. And it uh, uh, was an article talking about a number of cities and uh, towns, uh, primarily cities throughout the country, about 30 of them, have now enacted uh, zoning requirements that require new buildings to uh, become uh, fast charger, not necessarily fast, just uh, uh, EV charging ready. Uh, so this focuses on new developments of significant size, not homes, <coughs> that type of thing. Um, but the example they're, they're using was one adopted in the DC uh, District of Columbia, which would say that any uh, significant residential development or uh, commercial development uh, would have to not install the actual uh, equipment, but would have to uh, include the infrastructure improvement for electric vehicle charges uh, equal to 20% of whatever their, uh, their parking requirement would be. So if you had a, you know, with, the stuff that's going on down on, on uh, North Mill Pond, uh, that the developments would not have to put in the charges, but they would have to uh, run the underground utilities, that type of thing. And so the theory of that is that uh, it, it seems to be borne out with what we're realizing on cost is that if you have to go back and retrofit a site to install electric charging units, you're going to have a lot of expense that could be avoided if you, you know, put the, put the uh, utilities underground or whatever you're gonna do as part of the project, uh, you know, set up the location and the, and the lines from the transformer to serve these type of things. So uh, I, don't, I, I don't have a specific thing beyond that, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that, uh, I'm not sure what the process of this would be to request that the city council refer this to the planning board for, for uh, review or whether, I don't know whether the ETC could request a planning board review it, but it's something that probably should go through the review process that normally land use laws um, undergo. That's the privilege. If I can tee up uh, <laughs> Councillor Moreau, who's here um, for that very reason, that would be a great item for her uh, brand new fledgling committee to study. Not only that, I've been on the planning board for nine years and now the city council rep to the planning board, so. <laughs> um, do you want me to talk about, you're gonna put me on the spot to talk about this or do you want me to go into what I wanna talk about? <laughs> I think it's a good, good segue, maybe comment on process on how you maybe see Tom's suggestion and then comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly think that we could take a look at it and review it as the planning board. That's not a problem. Um, I don't see any reason why the EDC can't either through the city council or just directly through me as a city council rep on the planning board, refer it to the planning board to take a look at. That's, yeah, I don't see an issue with that unless our city manager finds that there would be an inappropriate direction. We get, uh, we have other business on our agendas all the time and, and recommendations from the city council all the time. So I think it could be added into that without an issue. Thank you. So 
Thank you for that. Now, now I, I just would like to jump in. Um, the one other thing that wasn't covered is that we have to look at the fast charging locations in reference to the larger parking product. There was some concern around having fast charging at, you know, downtown for two hours when it might be a, a better use for a more short ter short term spot. So, in addition to identifying locations, it, it, we have to look at the utilization rates of um, charging spots as well as. Um, the, the context of the larger parking product and ne necessity of turnaround in the town as well. So learned a lot of really good good stuff from Ben Fletcher as a result mm -hmm. of that conversation. Yeah, okay. good suggestion. Bob, did you have? A yeah, uh, just had a question for Tom or Sarah. Um, just in terms of the model of charging, and you were talking about uh, maybe uh, getting uh, proposals from a company to uh, locate a site. Uh, it, is there a revenue stream then associated with the city putting in charging stations? Can you charge for the electricity and get some money that way, or do you, you know, rent out the space to someone else who does that? So, is there a way to recoup uh, costs of setting those up, and then potentially have a income stream or several in the future? Well, uh, that in fact is what's going on right now with the existing level two charging stations at each of the city garages in the back lot uh, over here. Uh, so the, the, it's the city's land, the, there's a smart charger or something, the, the name of the company is, has these on it, but the yeah. city actually is, sells the electricity, if they will. Okay. Um, it is not a money maker. No, at that yeah. point in time. <laughs> well, not now, but maybe in the future. Yeah. You know, and particularly so if you have. Uh, if I can comment, so typically, like, and I've several. seen them out west, and you know, used a couple out there. Um, they are not. You don't pay for them. That would be against the norm. Um, they're free, and typically, how it works is after you hit your certain like percentage charge in the vehicle, then you get charged a very high rate. So you. It incentivizes you to move so someone else can use it but you know if you have like four spots in the garage like you would see the turnover as the vehicles are charged okay. but you don't make money off of it typically but 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 the ultimately is because we're in the nascent stage of this movement that's that's the case so right now you know when you bought a Tesla you got a promise that you would have free electricity for as long as you own the car they're talking, there's now some talk that by the end of this year, Tesla is going to open up its charges to other users. And in the, in the model essentially would be that if you're paying, you know, 10 cents an hour for electricity at home to, to uh, recharge your car with a level one or a level two charger at home, if you go to one of these fast ones, you'll probably be paying 20 cents an hour the d that differential is would be retained by whoever is running that so the the, the potential models on this are that uh, these things can be installed and <coughs> and operated by the owners or they could be installed and operated by separate companies you know so there are there the, there's a site owner there's the equipment manufacturer there's the operator of the site Anybody can be more than one of those, but they can also be three separate ones. It, well, if you're looking, if someone's asking you to, or wants to propose putting in a charging station, you would think there would be some financial incentive to that company. Otherwise, why would they do it? So. Well, well exactly. But but just as as uh, Caitlin suggested, so right now, for instance, if you were to get down to the shopping, the big shopping center that's in uh, Seabrook, right off of the exit, you can go in there, and there are probably about eight or ten charging units right there. They're free to use because they're trying to get you into their center. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if you're a Nissan uh, owner of electric car, you can get down to the Nissan dealership. They have one there. They're going to let you use it. But it's like. You know, these things are really just meant to be lost leaders until the penetration of right. electric vehicles okay. is so great that they essentially, you know, gas stations will phase out they and jack people up will be the sending rate. electricity. <laughs> <coughs> All right. I, got it. I think it's that, you know, they stop here instead of continuing to Portland if, they're, if they have, you know, better things. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you had sort of suggested we make a, a motion or take some action to 
Well, I, I, I'd be interested in Karen's thought on, because I kind of dropped this in her lap last Friday. <laughs> That's um, what I'm here for. Um, so it, when Tom and Peter Rice and I met, uh, the requests were, let's get on that state list, uh, let's develop an RFP to gauge interest in the site, uh, not, not only in terms of the t different types of charges, but different sites. And um, then we led up to the inclusion, the potential inclusion of some money in the CIP. So um, I think the timing is such that Councillor Denton's request will allow him to tee up that formal amendment on March 7th, the night we, we look to adopt the CIP. And you know, it, it's a good opportunity because we're, re we're redesigning and reconstructing the Bridge Street lot, the perfect timing. And um, in the grand scheme of things, there may be items in the capital outlay portion of the CIP or the cash portion, which have a little bit of ebb and flow. So this might fit in quite nicely with things that we thought we might have to pay for um, that we may not. Um, one is uh, a match to a, a different program that, that we may not no longer need in our CIP list. So um, I think we're, we're poised to um, provide the council with that information so that they can make a decision on including that number, whether it's 180 or whatever Peter decides is the best placeholder um, to the council. Maybe EDC might want to consider issuing a letter of support part of that as a uh, sort of generator. Any, any thoughts on that mm -hmm. sort of before in case we will talk about maybe um, our March meeting, but in the event that we don't meet on school vacation week on that Friday and meet the following week, that council meeting would happen before we have a chance to consider anything. So they would be a good time to. Are you looking for a motion? Uh, uh, we generally take a motion if we're issuing kind of a letter of yes. support. Yeah. In the past, we have routinely uh, written letters in support of the CIP in general and in at certain times calling out specific projects. So I think. Um, we, we could we could do both here. So, if anyone were so inclined, would certainly want to entertain a motion. Should I make a motion on <laughs> my own? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, then uh, I would move that the uh, EDC uh, issue a letter to the City Council uh, endorsing. Uh, generally endorsing the uh, uh, increased deployment of uh, level three fast uh, electric vehicle charging uh, stations in the city uh, and in, in the on uh, city property in particular. Um, I, I am hesitant to craft it so it's so specific without knowing what the proposal that's going to come out, but, but I think I, I think it's important that the city council know that the EDC sees this as a, a value f from an economic and a business development point of view. Second. Okay. So, um, all those in favor of the motion, call for a vote. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Right, so the motion passes. Thank you, Tom. So I know we're getting tight on time, and I want to thank uh, City Councilor Moreau for joining us. I want to introduce her and um, invite you to comment on the Land Use Committee and yeah. the role you might see the, an EDC member um, playing in that and the overall goal for the Land Use Committee. I appreciate you letting me have a little bit of time this morning. I promise to be quick. Um, so yeah, on Monday, I created the Land Use Committee, and the purpose of it is to review all current zoning policies surrounding housing and development to encourage sustainable, diverse, and affordable development, including expanded multimodal transportation. So that's our, our ultimate overarching purpose and goal. I um, put a lot of thought into the members of this committee so that we could make sure it would be a diverse committee. Um, there are three city councilors, two planning board members, two city staff from planning, um, and uh, one member of the Portsmouth Housing Authority, and then my last addition would be a member from this group, because I think that we're gonna really look at this not just from a regulatory side, but also taking a look at city-owned properties, um, what nonprofit development. Um, we wanna take a look at every aspect of how we can really move the city forward in the right direction. So, 
I don't know many of the, I know many of the people here, but I don't know all the members here and I don't know who might be the best person to actually um, participate in this group. Uh, so I was gonna leave it up to you guys, uh, not necessarily to fight it out, but you know, to have, <laughs> duke it out, whatever uh, yeah, the case may be, to, to who might wanna join. So as of right now for actual uh, participants, it's myself, uh, Assistant Mayor uh, Kelly, uh, Councillor Blaylock, uh, Planning Director um, Zent, uh, City Planner uh, Cracknell, um, both the Vice Chair and the Chair of the Planning Board, which is Rick Chelman and Corey Clark, and Craig Welsh from uh, Portsmouth Housing Authority. So we have a pretty, I think so far, good group, and I'm just looking for uh, suggestions from you all as to who might want to join that. Mr. Chairman, while people are thinking about that, Councillor, can you speak to the cadence of meetings? How often do you think you're gonna meet? What's the time commitment? So our first meeting has already been scheduled. It is a week from today at 8 a.m. in this very room. Um, I'm really hoping that at least our first meeting will be fully in person. I think at this point only our um, planning director is going to be remote through Zoom. Uh, so I wanted our first meeting, uh, Beverly Zent, our planning director and I have been working closely together to try to formulate a framework of what we're gonna look at. And I think we're probably gonna break the group up into two smaller groups to do a bunch of research to then bring back to the bigger group. One will be looking more at the market side and one will be looking more at the regulatory side. So that's how we're um, breaking that up. Uh, so is our hope to meet in the mornings just because many of us on this committee already have our nights fairly full. <laughs> so I've made that kind of a requirement. Um, and and it's, yeah, where where we can talk at our first meeting as to how often. Um, it is my hope that we will have some immediate recommendations back to the city council within 30 days of our first meeting. And then hopefully every couple of months after that, we will have either recommendations or at least reports back as to the direction that we're heading in so I want us to act fairly quickly on there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can attack very quickly on several aspects and then there will be some longer term things like looking at the housing opportunity zones that we've never looked at before and different things like that that I think that we can um, bring to the city anything else you want to talk about <laughs> Thank you. Great. No, I just on behalf of the EDC appreciate the opportunity for for someone to have uh, some so a voice as part of this group I think it's a, a Highly worthy and, and overdue effort that we're excited to see get underway, and I'm sure uh, anyone on the commission would be a great fit. But certainly would ask anyone who's interested to either reach out. So th you'll need the appointee by next Friday's meeting. So if you want to partake in the yeah, first absolutely. one, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to give you a week, but oh, we just fine. created this on Monday, so to even have a meeting set by today, I thought was pretty amazing. <laughs> I would agree. That's great. <laughs> I hate to ask people to add more meetings to their workload, but um, I think in the short term, we might have to at least converse often, even if it's, uh, you know, a couple of us here and there getting together to look over some stuff. But as a full meeting, I mean, I hope that we don't have to meet more than once a month to, at the start. So um, that, that is my hope and my goal anyways. Any other questions? When do you expect to have your report out? What, what, what's the time frame for accomplishing the whole thing? What I've given the city council is that our first recommendations to them would be within 30 days of our first meeting. So uh, by, so let's see, next Friday is what, the end of the month? Or are we the, still the middle of the month? Middle, <laughs> middle of the month. <laughs> Thank you. So that, that would be that we'd be reporting back with our first recommendations and that hopefully then within 60 days thereafter, each of those, so every two months after that, report back uh, with recommendations that we may have more or at least be able to give them the progress of where we are on each, each, each one of those initiatives. And, and so if, if that's the case, you're expecting this to be a year-long process or a six-month-long process? I'm expecting probably from completion to end, it could be a year to two years um, in, in all sincerity because I think some of these things might take a little longer and take more public input. Um, that will probably be, the committee probably won't have to meet as often once we get the sh sort of short-term stuff kind of going. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is I don't think we'll be able to do it all in a year, so I think it might take two years. But I don't know that for out of fact. I mean, who knows? We may be so fabulous, we have it done in six months, but <laughs> that would be pretty much a miracle. <laughs> I have high, high goals, what can I say? <laughs> But as Beth said, if I may comment, as, as, as Councilor Monroe said, there's there's some pretty low lion fruit that I that you know I know. Like looking at our ADU laws, I think that 
right now, I mean, I was around when we created the AD laws, and we had very specific reasons for um, keeping them the way we do. We wanted to have, the planning board wanted to make sure that we could every day see the ones coming before us and see the issues. And I think that we can really do an evaluation of that right now. And I think there are certain ones, if you meet whatever criteria that is out there, uh, you get it by right versus actually having to go through a conditional use permit. So that's a low hanging fruit that we can do right away. We can look at the incentives for workforce housing in our different districts. And I think we could tighten those up pretty darn quickly. So you see where there are some things that I think we could very easily have recommendations on how to make adjustments within a short period of time. Would they be taking effect in that period of time? No, because we would make recommendations to the city council who will then send it to the planning board who then would have a public process about it and then it would go back to the city council, another public process till it goes in. So you can see how it could probably take three to four months just for that to take effect. But I think we could have recommendations for that back to them in short enough time that that process could happen in probably three to four months. That's my estimation. I, I know it's your committee and I know uh, Ben has also been very active um, from the chamber perspective. Has there been thought about bringing in the chamber for broader economic interests or is this more uh, city board? Nope. Not, not to I, add more to that. I've ben. actually already <laughs> started to have conversations with the executive director of the Workforce Housing Coalition. I've had some conversations with some other, um, I don't know if any of you know, uh, Darren Widom, who works at Exeter, who actually has done a lot with the Housing Opportunity Zones. I've actually been talking to people already to bring in individual speakers to come and talk to the group. So I know Ben very well, actually. <laughs> ben and I briefly discussed this, but he doesn't know it yet. But yes, I was going to reach out to him, too, because I would like to have uh, different people coming in to actually give us their input from an outside. So maybe not a member on the committee, but people that we definitely work in conjunction with to get that input. Tom, you had a it's just a follow up on the scope of the committee. Is the transportation component tied into the affordable housing or is that a separate? I think it's, I think that the reason why I added the transportation component is because I think good transportation systems are part of all affordable housing projects. And I think if you don't add it to the conversation, you're missing a giant piece and you won't get there. That's why it's there. So, it's plain and simple. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm good at being grilled, really. <laughs> so, yes, I might suggest anyone who's interested to reach out and, and let me know, and we'll certainly have someone, we'll have representation at, at the meeting next Friday, I can assure you that, and if yeah. everyone has a chance to consider it, I guess reach out and let me know, and we can have a conversation and we'll get that. And if anybody just wants to talk to me further about it, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm, I know everyone, several people here already know how to reach me, so. <laughs> I, have, I have a business here in town. I have my office over in Greenleaf Woods Drive. Stop by, say hello. Uh, anyone's welcome to come in and we can have a chat about it. It's not, I'm an open book as far as this is concerned. I want this committee to be successful, so. So what I'll do is I'll send to the EDC for their consideration what you propose, the, the text of what you propose, yep. and your contact information for yep. questions. Um, any, anything else? Okay, that's it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Alan. I've got to run for a uh, family member to an appointment, but I wanted to welcome Councillors Lombardi and Assistant Mayor Kelly to the commission. We're very excited to have you. And Thank you, also Chairman. wanted to welcome and recognize Ben's uh, involvement and attendance this morning. So we appreciate it and look forward to being more collaborative with you moving forward. So um, let's give it to Alan and try to run through the the rest of everything. Thank you, everyone. I'll do my best. Good luck. Thanks, Phil. Take care. All right, Alan, you have five minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, uh, my brief moment of fame. Um, um, I guess, Nancy, this is, uh, this is over um, to you. That's a question mark at the end regarding the uh, approval of West End DRZ expansion. Yep. I can do this in 30 seconds. Grab a mic, Nancy. I can do this in 30 seconds. Um, I will pass out the um, approved expanded zone. The purple area, oh, I'm sorry. I should have passed it. The purple area is the existing zone. We went to the city council on January 24th and at the recommendation of, uh, I think it was, I think it was uh, Cliff. Councilor Lazenby. Yeah, Councilor Lazenby yeah. and um, Assistant Mayor mm -hmm. last last term um, to instead of just talking about it at the at the EDC level, bring it 
for an educational purpose to um, to the council, and I thought that was a great suggestion because that's exactly what it turned out to be. Um, at the blue zero, the blue outlined area is the expanded zone, and you get your bearings. You can see that um, Route One is the is, is on the left side of the map, and we've included all of West End Yards, and it would be primarily just the commercial property there. The residential area is not eligible. Um, development of residential is not eligible, but any commercial um, or office property that creates jobs is. So we sent a letter to uh, the state on the 27th, uh, or actually on the 25th, and they responded that they approved the zone. So we will get this up on the website that we now have an expanded uh, West End ERZ. And we've had a couple inquiries already, a pretty interesting company called Bridge Appliances that's looking at uh, 909 Islington Street as, um, as a future headquarters of their um, home appliance, uh, electronic home appliance. They have a, what is it? It's called the Ohm, Karen. It's the... Uh, it, it's, it's new technology for an older. old use, right. Exactly. And ironically, <laughs> they reached out to us the day this was on the agenda, if exactly. not the day before. So it was really cool timing. Yep, and we have um, some of the commercial realtors are also interested in um, working with some of their clients on, a on accessing the credits that are available through the zone. So that's it. That was no longer than 30 seconds. Sorry. Yep, thank you. Any, uh, any questions uh, on the topic? Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman, uh, I, I need to leave, so thank you. I'll watch the rest on the recording. Thanks, of course, Bob. feel free to talk about me while I'm gone. <laughs> and, uh, I'll just assign time. you Sorry. to things. Not enough time. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I nominate Bob to be on that new There meeting. you go. <laughs> <laughs> Should have waited 30 more seconds. <laughs> All right. Um, well, th this this will not take long. Uh, <laughs> update on the McIntyre building redevelopment. Mr. Chairman, I'll take that. Um, as you may uh, be aware, last night the City Council voted to rescind the actions taken uh, by the prior council at the November 18th, 2021 meeting. Essentially what that does is get us back to the, the discussion table, if you will, and pave the way to remove lawsuits as an impediment to move forward with the project. So. Um, I'm happy if, if you think it's appropriate to leave this on as a monthly update. We should have um, a more robust update at the next meeting. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Um, update on the City Council retreat. Uh, Assistant Mayor or um, City Councilor Lombardi, would either of you like to? Uh, I actually had to leave the retreat early, so I would pass that to. <laughs> we had you for the good part, though. Yeah. yeah. I can start up. Uh, at the retreat, we, it was great we did it at the Senior Center. Uh, we were able to kind of, as a, as a council, um, led by an, uh, an amazing speaker that day, kind of really break out in some groups and outline the things that really hit home for us and, and the things that we want to achieve. Um, overall, some overarching um, topics, affordable housing, workforce housing, um, uh, making sure that we can be a... Um, that we're not completely dependent on tourists and tourism for economic development and growth, um, making sure that we are reinforcing um, kind of our small businesses outside of downtown. Um, a big hot topic item is if also if you watch um, the council meeting on Monday, um, outside on street dining, uh, what that kind of looks like going forward post COVID world uh, and set in a policy for long, uh, long future hall for that. Um, I would have Ms. Lombardi or the city manager mm -hmm. pop in, in some other topics. Okay, I, I, I'm not sure I can add much more to that. We did, <laughs> we right. did uh, talk about very wide-ranging and broad topics um, that having to do with um, the, the conduct of the council uh, as well as um, uh, redefining our, um, our goals uh, for, the, for the year or for the, our sessions. Um, I don't have them, I, I have them here, but I don't, I, they're not in front of me. Um, I wasn't expecting to do this. <laughs> That's right. That's okay. If it's helpful, I, I can jump yeah, in. I, I think yeah. the, the assistant mayor captured a bunch of them. Uh, and, and another one that, that came through was communication uh, among uh, staff and council to do a good job uh, and to communicate with the public. And not only to communicate out to the public, but to take input in from the public. So there's a big push to 
enhance communication in a two-way fashion. So. I would also add a big push um, um, for myself, and I know uh, uh, I would say the council as a whole, is to figure out also the city's role, uh, residents and, and city government's role of affordable and workforce housing. Um, I, you know, I think we always, and, and as um, the assistant city attorney mentioned, there's a lot of bills, there's, there's a lot of communication. We always know there's a big need for it. Um, but for myself as assistant mayor is really to figure out what that role looks like and what um, us as a, as a governing body and what the residents and what city staff, what role we actually need to play in that. If we are just a bystander in it, if we're just regulatory in it, if we are a partner in it, if we are a developer in it. And so that's really kind of a, just, just so you know, passion project of mine of really outlined in that. So from a procedure procedural standpoint, we're going to ask if Mayor McEachern is comfortable bringing the, the draft to final goals forth at the next city council meeting so everyone can see the work that the council did with some of the senior staff. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Look forward to seeing more uh, information on that and working very closely with you, obviously. Uh, I think we covered the ARPA funding we did. Uh, status sufficiently, so can we move on? And under other business, I would suggest that uh, the uh, Chamber Ben provide uh, an update, and uh, if you're comfortable with that, we'll add that to the agenda uh, for our meetings moving forward. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, not um, too, too much to update for us uh, right now. We are currently, um, a week from today, um, putting together a meeting with the restaurant community and the city staff to review the outdoor dining um, draft plans for this coming season. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest from that community and what those plans look like. Uh, I've never been so popular amongst restaurant tours. Um, they think I had no information, but I, I don't, so I just get to talk to them. Um, but uh, so there's a lot of interest around that. There's a lot of community dialogue around that, so we're very um, anxious to support that. Um, and uh, also, um, as uh, you'll see in today's online paper, paper if you get such a paper version, um, uh, the, uh, the parking. Um, uh, changes with the, the Hanover Street renovations, um, garage renovations, so we'll be uh, committed to working with the city to help reduce whatever impacts that may have on our downtown community, uh, business community, residents, and the like. So um, I know that is uh, work that's uh, about to tee off and necessary work that needs to be done, so uh, we'll be here to partner with the city in any way we can to support the, the business community downtown throughout that process, the three-year process, it seems like. So. Mr. Chairman, can I add to Ben is being uh, gracious to allow non-members to join uh, the Zoom conversation next Friday at 1030, and it won't just be restaurants, it'll be businesses of any type, residents. It, he's really been uh, gracious to open that up. Yep. Excellent. And then the last thing, I, I believe I've shared in, uh, through the chair, shared an invite to uh, our session next Tuesday night um, at the Music Hall, uh, the future of calling Portsmouth home. I um, hope you can join us. We'll, uh, Assistant Mayor Kelly will be one of our speakers. Uh, Mayor McEachern will uh, be our, our, uh, our MC for the evening, our, our welcoming people. And uh, we have a great panel discussion, including our, our new planning uh, director, uh, Beverly Zent. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, attendance looks good for that. So continue to have that housing discussion, push it forward. Extremely excited about uh, Council Moreau's committee. Um, she's uh, got a lot. I wanted to give her a high five the entire time she was talking, but uh, that was inappropriate. So, anyways, but uh, we're very excited about that, and we look forward to seeing some action in that regard. Excellent. Thanks so much. Maybe shout out for advanced planning for the tourism zone. Yes, uh, yes, uh, down the road, uh, March 23rd uh, sticks out of my head. Um, we'll be having our tourism summit. It's our annual gathering of the, the local tourism community. Um, again, that will be, um, we, we are really trying to break down some walls. Um, that will be open to members and non-members alike. Um, we, we really welcome everyone to our events um, and, and hope to show them the values that they join. Uh, but that'll be uh, eight, 8 to 11 at uh, Jimmy's on Congress. On the 23rd, we have the state's tourism director. We'll have an update from the city manager and the mayor. Uh, we have a couple other exciting um, uh, initiatives to, to launch and showcase, including the uh, arts and culture destination marketing that we're doing in conjunction with the new committee that was the Blue Ribbon Committee for Arts and Nonprofits. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, that, that work will launch well before that tourism summit, but um, um, we'll be showcasing that work there. Uh, so there's a lot going on. We are extremely busy we, we, uh, planning out spring and summer events. Um, you know, with uh, the COVID numbers being what they, they were, um, um, I, I, you know, we haven't done a lot lately, but we're really looking forward to the, the warmer months in, in the summer season. 
Um, I will just kind of uh, say, just because you gave me the opportunity to talk, so I, I will take advantage of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, we did have a, a, a small meeting with a few restaurants uh, yesterday, and, and there was a, a lengthy discussion about the mask mandate. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, basically, the restaurant staffs were, were coming to the owners and saying, do you realize we are one of the few restaurants in the city that's still following this mask mandate? And I would just, as I observed having lunch out yesterday, that the entire staff of the restaurant I was at did not follow the mask mandate. Um, so uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, when that would end and, and all that, so I just thought I'd offer that up as a discussion going on amongst the restaurant community um, and the hospitality community. So just food for thought. Okay, thanks very much, Ben. Appreciate it. Uh, and that summit will be a very interesting one. Um, and uh, in next week's meeting as well, I, I, I know there was a number of email uh, passing around, so I think you'll have good, uh, good attendance from the EDC there. So look forward to, to that. You need to register. Yes, you do need to register. Um, we've circulated the uh, link, and we can certainly send that back out if there's a if you've missed it. Um, but it should be a really good uh, discussion. So thanks for the reminder on that. We, uh, we can cover yes. the the high entrance fee of five dollars. Five bucks. <laughs> If you need the cheapest event you'll ever go to, if you need to call. and the two dollar and the, and the two dollar <laughs> convenience fee, so it's, oh, yeah. it's seven dollars. Yeah, but you know, I thought it was a worthwhile. Right, when you, you get there too, it's person, fine. Yeah, <laughs> not a problem. Okay. Uh, is there? I, well, I know we're over time, but I want to uh, open it up for other business, Caitlin. I just have. I know that both you guys mentioned the on street dining, and I think that that was something that. You know, I know it's anecdotal, but that in my circles, I heard a lot of people, you know, both in town and out of town, saying like. This is, you know, fantastic. This is like really what Portsmouth was missing, and you know, people feeling like they see their neighbors on the street a little bit more. And um, is there any like support needed from the EDC? And I don't know how everybody else feels about it. But. Um, so I would just speak as a, a council perspective. We we understand it's a sensitive topic. Um, I think you know that I have to say the overarching reception of it is great. Um, uh, we do understand that there are in the in the packet this past Monday that there are businesses downtown that are not restaurants that are worried about their impact um, so obviously we welcome them that discussion we support that discussion we support other businesses also um, so we're really trying to find a happy medium um, I'm really excited to see what staff brings back as in fees and, and spacing and sizing and and, and how that looks um, I think we and I think supporters of uh, on street dining. We, I tend to call it on street dining versus outdoor dining because we do have already cafe and sidewalk, um, you know, policies. So this is really on street. Um, you know, my perspective is we kind of have one shot if we really want to get a policy that's long, you know, that's you know a long effect, long past COVID. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to work on this. I, I do believe that there is community support, resident support. Um, so I personally have been speaking with a lot of residents that if you support this, you need to be vocal about it. Because um, as we know, you know the, the people that potentially feel that they are negatively affected by it are vocal. So people that feel in support of it need to be vocal. Um, and so if that is the EDC or individual residents or other business owners that maybe are not in the hospitality world, but do you see that it is a benefit to the, to the community overall, um, I, would, I would advise that they, they share their opinions. Mr. Chairman, can I just add quickly that uh, whatever the council decides on February 22nd when, when this policy decision comes before them based on some of the information we'll give them and, and we'll help them get there um, to whatever decisions they want to make, we're ready to stand up the, um, the program, if there is a program, on the 23rd. And um, you may recall last year there were certain folks who could um, set things up in the outdoor, in the public realm on March 1st if they weren't on street and needing a barrier or in a parking space. Um, we're going to aim to, if that's the will of the council, we, we, we can be prepared to keep that same schedule we had last year, March 1st for some folks, first week of April for most other folks, again, if that is what the council wants to support. But I, I want to give people a sense that we're not starting from scratch on the permitting end, that we'll be ready to roll with whatever decisions are made. Excellent. Yeah, I would just yes. like to add, the only uh, negative I've heard is parking, and the, the, it, in, it impacts the amount of parking downtown. That, that's... But I, I frankly, I mean, personally, I find that it, the whole thing makes the city more walkable. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I view that as a plus myself. I would second that. I, I would, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think the supporters understand that it, it, it implements more of our master plan of pedestrian, walkable, friendly uh, downtown. And, and, and again, it's not just downtown. This expands into the West End. This expands into anything in the North End. Um, but yeah, I, I think it definitely falls into the, the implementation of our, of our master plan. Right. It was really an activation of our streetscapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think people will spend more time and more money in the other shops if they're down there for outdoor dining. I agree. Because they can now get a table, maybe. And we all know that the restaurants will, um, speaking of, as a restaurant owner at, the, at this point, um, there's, there's, it's a, it's a big investment. And not every, not every small restaurant and not every you know, small business can afford um, a, a massive parklet or, or a huge investment unless we know that this is a recurring mm -hmm. a recurring theme and that and you know everyone that I've spoken to is willing to invest a good amount of money to make it look look mm -hmm. good much like Newburyport where they the, you know the city has provided parklets and X Y and Z um, so I think it's a really it's a really great program great. obviously I campaigned on it so <laughs> <laughs> excellent looking forward to it looking I would forward also to the commend culture. the uh, high school students who you know, created very attractive barriers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, did a great job. And we don't have to build them this year. So I, I move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Before we do that, um, I think there's been a couple people that have expressed um, the, the interest in possibly moving the March meeting only because it's school vacation week. It is the end of school. And I don't know. Um, you know, we have members here with young kids in school. Um, is there anyone that's adverse to moving it a week later, which would put it to March 11th? Why would we? No. I guess not. It's okay with Tom. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we will good. modify that to the 11th. Thank you. Now, Caitlin. Yes, we have a motion. <laughs> I mean, Sarah. <laughs> we have a motion. I'm moved to adjourn. <laughs> a second, please. Aye. Second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for a good Thank meeting.